Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure, Simon Catt from Arlington in London, along with my co-host Peter Ganston of Mining Network, to introduce five of the most interesting and influential commentators on the precious metal market and the big picture from a macro point of view on the monetary metals, gold and silver. Um, very briefly, uh, I'm going to introduce Michael Oliver, Luke Groman, uh, Eric Sprott, Pierre Lassonde, Ned Leyland. They're going to run through for between seven and ten minutes on their views. We're going to have some informal conversation along the way. Um, and with that, Michael Oliver, uh, fabled technical analyst, momentum structural analysis, we'd love to hear your um, views on where we are in the cycle of precious metals and generally for, for markets. Well, I won't bore you with a bunch of charts, okay? <laughs> we look at charts at MSA, that's what we do. Not price charts, but we have our own unorthodox method of momentum structural analysis. And it's been very good for us for 32 years in terms of timing major market tops and bottoms. We look at all the asset categories. But right now, never before have the relationships between certain major asset categories been more correlated, either inversely or in sync. And uh, this, this all impacts the Fed, of course. And the Fed, of course, is the constant destroyer of money, along with the ECB and the BOJ and so forth. And of course, that's what the prime driving power of gold. But anyway... So let's first look at one of those tectonic plates, uh, and that's the stock market. And as we know that um, it was, since MSA has been in business in 1992, there have been a couple big stock market bubbles, at least what we call in hindsight bubbles. And that would be the move from 1994 through 2000, which was labeled the dot-com bubble. And uh, then there was the move from the 2003 low in the S&P up to 2007, which saw a doubling in the S&P and also a real estate bubble that was coincident with it. And there's a, a variable underlying both of those moves that, you know, you wonder why did they occur? And if you go back, if you go to the St. Louis Fed online and type in M2, okay, you'll see that there's a constant growth in money supply. Every decade, basically, since the 50s, M2 has almost doubled every decade. And it's fa fairly unchanging, regardless of whether you have recessions or not during that time period. It's pretty much a constant. In fact, over the last 10 years, it's been more than a double. But the, the variable that to, to look at in terms of the stock market is the Fed funds, with the, with the, with the rate the central bank controls, the short end of the market. And you can punch that chart up on uh, St. Louis Fed site, the Fed funds history. And you go back and look back in prior to the dot-com bubble, they drove the Fed funds rate to the lowest level in 30 years. And they kept it there for a couple of years, 92 through 94. And that in effect filled the tank, so to speak, of liquidity. And that helped sponsor the, what came, the dot-com bubble, which would have occurred anyway, but they, they definitely fed it to become a bigger monster than it became. And uh, later, of course, when it burst, the NASDAQ 100 dropped 82%, S&P dropped 50%, but it was a bubble. Everybody looks back on it as one. And then uh, the next bubble that came along was at the end of all that uh, in 2001 through 2004. In other words, as the bear market was occurring, 2001 to two, they were cutting rates drastically and they got them down to the lowest level in 50 years. Fed funds rate. And it stayed there for a couple of years uh, through 2001 to four. And of course, then that drove a doubling of the S&P up through 2007, but also the real estate bubble. And when that broke, in fact, they cut rates at the top, by the way, the Fed did in September of 2007, the market peaked October of 2007, market collapsed anyway, but they'd already fed, filled the tank and created the bubble. So what do we have now? Why is it that when most of the bubbles in history, going back to the origin of the Fed, have been doubles and triples and possibly even a quadruple for the stock market at the time? And they usually only span four or five years in duration. How come this one has lasted from 2009 through the present and been a sevenfold for the S&P and a 16-fold for the NASDAQ 100? Not a triple or a double or a quadruple, but a sevenfold and a sixteenfold. Go look at the M2 chart again. No, not M2. Excuse me, Fed funds chart, and you'll see it's been laying at zero since uh, you know 2000. Uh, what uh, 2008 to the present, 
there was a little two year deviation there where they took it up to 2.3, but then with the COVID event, they took it back down to zero. Well, that helped spawn, spawn what we, we've got now, a bubble. And we think it is a technical bubble. And when it breaks, I think there'll be many negative consequences to come. Consequences that are painful for the average guy. Other market to watch is T-bonds. It's the long end of the debt market. The Fed does not control that end of the market very well, as evidenced by the action of the last year or so. Right now, T-bonds are again choking. The Fed quit raising rates, but uh, the, the T-bond market hasn't. That's a variable to watch, because as long as that keeps choking, you're going to have negative economic data points coming down the road, especially when the stock market turns down. Well, who's the prime beneficiary of all this? Monetary metals. Again, look at an M2 chart. Or when I was a little kid, a loaf of bread cost 20 cents. Okay, now it costs $3.80. I guess we have one heck of a wheat shortage, right? Okay, no. It's a constant decay in the underlying value of the dollar or of the euro or the yen or whatever. And gold reflects that ongoing. It breathes up and down, but it, it reflects that. But then there's times when these sort of events occur that panic the central banks namely the collapsing of certain asset categories they deem to be important, stock market being one of them. They won't admit it. Uh, and even now, maybe there's a political motivation for them to uh, not want things to come undone, uh, if you get what I, the point I'm making there. Uh, anyway, I think we have the most interesting set of dynamics for this year that we've ever seen in markets compressed into a short-term period of time. And I think gold and silver and the, and the miners are about to go vertical. Now, they've done this before. If you go back and look at the bull market that ended in 79 through 1980, most of the bull market occurred in that last year. In fact, if you, if you missed the entire thing and you got in in 79, you caught the bull market. 2000 to 2011, most of the move occurred in mid-2010 through 2011, so compressed within several quarters. And during those times, not only did gold silver go vertical, but silver outpaced gold by double and triple. So I think we're, on, we're there now. We have enough technical evidence at MSA to say, one, we're entering the acceleration phase for the, the monetary metal bull trend, which began from the low in 2015. And at this point, we have enough technical metrics to say silver's about to re-engage versus gold. And so too are the miners on a percentage basis going forward. And I think the dynamics are there. I think it's gonna be the most fun football game you've ever seen. It's gonna take three quarters of a year, but a lot of it's gonna get done this year. And there's another variable out there that nobody discusses, and that's the political one. And that's probably uh, reverberations from what's going on underneath the surface for the average human being, the economy. And that is a sense of nervousness, and there's no outcome that I can anticipate this next election that will be, quote, quote, copacetic. No outcome will be copacetic. And I don't mean it has to be violent, but it would not surprise me on either side. In fact, the University of Virginia Department of Politics did a poll of likely Democrat voters, likely Trump voters, and asked them certain very pregnant questions. And it kept coming up with a large percentage of those voters on both sides who thought if the other side win, one, violence would be justified. And another large portion that thought, hmm, maybe secession would be justified. There is not going to be a copacetic outcome. So mix that into all this other stuff. And that's that explains why gold is doing what it's doing now. Thank you, Michael. Uh, if, if that's uh, your, your headline comments, can I ask you one question before we uh, invite Luke to give us his comments? In terms of your conviction on where we are as a bullish backdrop for monetary metals, where are we in the context of your historical? I think you mentioned 1992 is when MSA started researching technical analysis mm -hmm. and momentum. How how bullish are you now compared to those 30 years? How convinced am I of what I just said? Never been more convinced in my life that the outcome is going to be dramatic across the board not just in gold and silver, the monetary metals, but in uh, certain, in other markets, but also in the everyday reality, people's lives. Remember 2008 and nine, people who weren't even in the stock market were hurt. It was painful. This bubble is far, far bigger. When it comes down, the errors that have been committed because of the false pricing of money by the Fed. I mean, when money's free, you make a decision to commit, right? 
build a new factory. Family wants to build a bigger home, et cetera, et cetera. All kinds of things based on that erroneous information. So there's all kinds of real world consequences that I'm convinced it's about to unfold, uh, both in the markets and politics and in the, in the everyday man's life. Thank 100%. you, Mark. <laughs> With that, and we will, uh, each speaker will have an opportunity to uh, to give us any further thoughts and Q&A um, as we get through the webinar. Um, if I can ask each speaker before we, as we wrap up, to think about your your gold and silver prize forecast uh, in 12 months time from now. Um, so we'll save that until the end for the punchline. But I'd like to introduce now Luke Groman. Um, I, I'm a subscriber to Luke's Forest for the Trees newsletter and believe that he actually has the most interesting and original context of how the US bond market elections, China, BRICS, um, um, and monetary metals fit together. Luke, um, where are we and what are your forecasts for markets, monetary metals, and big changes ahead for uh, for those subjects? Yeah, thanks for having me, Simon, um, and, and for the kind words. Uh, I agree entirely with Michael's point of the post-2000 timeframe where we kicked the bursting, we kicked the bursting dot-com bubble upstairs to the housing market to try to paper over the demand lost, created a housing bubble, it burst. Uh, we papered over by kicking the problem upstairs to the sovereign debt level uh, via Western governments in particular, basically backstopping much uh, of the financial system. And now in my view, we are well into the first bursting global sovereign debt bubble since in the immediate aftermath of World War I. When you look back historically to sovereign debt levels where the problem is now centered in the West, not in the developing markets, uh, as has historically been the case over the last 40 to 50 years, uh, there's historically over the last 120 or so years uh, only been three ways out. You get some sort of productivity miracle. Uh, you get sustained high rates of inflation. There have been a few hyperinflations within that. Uh, or you restructure the debt one way, in some way, shape, or form. So a good example, I think, uh, is in the immediate aftermath of World War II, which was the last time U.S. debt to GDP was as high as it is now. End of World War II, 1946, U.S. debt to GDP is 110%. Um, and from 1946 to 1960, a period of roughly 14 years, the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield was consistently 300 to 400 basis points below nominal GDP growth in the United States. Uh, in other words, long bonds were certificates of confiscation for 14 or 15 years. Uh, you had a, a pretty big productivity boom as well. And U.S. debt to GDP fell in that time from 110 percent unsustainable to 40 percent sustainable. Fast forward to 2010. If we look at the period 2010 to 2024, it shows the problem in very stark terms. 2010 to 2024 is, again, a 14-year period, like 1946 to 60. Like 1946 to 60, the 10-year Treasury yield has consistently been below nominal GDP growth in the United States for almost the entire period. We have had productivity gains in the form of um, internet, social media, connectivity, et cetera. But instead of debt to GDP going from 110% to 40%, unsustainable to sustainable, as it did in the 14 years from 46 to 60, debt to GDP in the U.S. has gone from 86% to 122%. Furthermore, debt to GDP has not moved now since the second quarter of 2021. We've stopped deleveraging. It's actually as a result of Fed rate hikes on the way back up. And so what this all means is that the, the Fed and Treasury and U.S. policymakers, and by virtue of the fact that uh, the dollar is the global reserve currency, Western policymakers are all much closer to being cornered than they realize and than markets realize. And the way out of this is very straightforward. It's a much, much weaker dollar and or a sustained period of significantly negative real interest rates, of allowing interest rates to be well below rates of inflation and nominal GDP growth. Uh, to be blunt, the Fed needed to let inflation run at 8 to 12% uh, for much longer than they did. Um, they, that's what needs to be higher for longer while they cap interest rates using their balance sheet or some version 
of yield curve control. And had they done that, let uh, inflation run higher for longer in 22, 23, 24, that the GDP would probably be back to near 80% or so by now where the Fed could then tighten and manage monetary policy in an independent manner without creating repeated treasury market dysfunction as they have since 2019. Unfortunately, of course, they didn't do that. Some of that due to political expedience with U.S. midterm elections in 2022. And so now the Fed's aggressive rate hikes into debt to GDP that was at all time highs or at near record highs has pushed the U.S. government into fiscal dominance periodically. It's not full time fiscal dominance yet, but every time the dollar gets too high, it touches off a new round of Treasury market dysfunction. Uh, and too high, quote unquote, for the dollar uh, in terms of starting to break the Treasury market has gone from 114 on the DXY in 3Q22 to 107 on the DXY in 3Q23 to 105 last week on the DXY. And what we know is whether it was the repo rate spike in 19 or the COVID crisis and where Treasury market crashed in, in March 20, or 22, 3Q22, 1Q23, 3Q23, every prior episode of treasury market dysfunction, which we define as the move index going above 130, uh, the, the Bank of uh, America liquidity, move li treasury liquidity index going above 130, that's where you're starting, the Fed is starting to lose control of the bond market. Once that happens, every time, the uh, the Fed and or Treasury or its proxies quickly supply more dollar liquidity. What what needs to be done is is something we wrote to clients in April of 2021, which is if you analyze the situation, we said if you take the five year period where most of the heavy lifting was done from 46 to 51 in terms of negative real rates and delevering the U.S. government balance sheet and carried that forward to today, as of April 2021, we needed a, a roughly negative 12 to negative 18 percent real rates uh, to make the U.S. debt position sustainable. And we would need the, that stunning level of negative real rates for a period of three to five years. By virtue of the Fed not allowing inflation to run higher for longer in 2021, and the debt having risen, the, the deficit uh, with unemployment still very low having risen, uh, arguably the level of real rates needed to get out of this um, is, is higher is, or is more negative. So I think gold is starting to sniff that out. I think the monetary metals are starting to sniff that out. I think the world is starting to sniff that out when we look at what is happening with global FX reserves foreign central banks have not added to their treasury holdings since 2014. And in fact, they've net sold uh, about three or four hundred billion dollars worth. And they've been steadily buying gold that whole time as it became more and more mathematically apparent uh, that while the timing was uncertain, the outcome was not, which was that the United States could not afford its debt load without a sustained period of significantly negative real interest rates. Since 2022, in the aftermath of U.S. sanctions on Russian FX reserves, uh, the pace of central bank gold buying has only accelerated. And then the, I think the final uh, accelerant or catalyst of all of this has been an accelerating move to price uh, the marginal ton of commodities and in particular oil in Chinese yuan because it is a matter of national security for the Chinese. Otherwise, they run the risk of running out of dollars with which to buy oil and suffering a Southeast Asia-like currency crisis a la 1997, which is simply not uh, politically uh, palatable for the Chinese. And so they've been shifting marginal purchases of energy and other commodities into yuan. The problem, of course, which is a very valid con uh, concern raised by many market participants, is nobody trusts the yuan. Uh, nobody wants to hold Chinese government debt. And importantly, the Chinese do not want to settle those imbalances in Chinese government bonds like America has settled them in uh, U.S. Treasuries in no small part, because they understand that Triffin's dilemma would ultimately do to them long term 
what it is, has done to the U.S. now that we're now seeing in terms of needing significantly negative real interest rates just to keep the wheels on the cart. And so by virtue of all of, all of this, uh, there's been much discussion of the BRICS currency. What's the BRICS currency? The BRICS currency is gold. Uh, you are seeing more and more non-dollar commodity transactions, particularly among the BRICS and in Eurasia, uh, particularly in Yuan. And what's happening is, is it's local currency transactions. It's being balanced out with trade with Chinese goods. So if Russia ends up with yuan imbalances, uh, they can buy Chinese goods. And then net amounts are being settled in gold. And so Chinese, uh, the, the BRICS currency, Ch yuan oil demand is turning gold back into an oil currency. And uh, on an annual dollar production basis, the oil market annually in dollar terms is 12 to 15 times the size of the physical gold market. So uh, like Michael, I'm very, very bullish gold. I think it would be good for all the monetary metals, but I'm going to pause there and uh, pass it to the uh, the next speaker. So thank you. Luke, thank you. Many thanks for keeping the time. Uh, next speaker I'm going to invite, um, he needs no introduction in the world of, of mining finance, mining investment, probably the most famous name in, in Canada. Uh, Eric Sprott, uh, nice to see you. You look like you're casually dressed. Are you somewhere warm at the moment? Uh, I happen to be luckily in Turks and Caicos, and yes, it's very pleasant down here. Uh, Eric, thanks for joining. Um, uh, Eric, you, you've been through a few cycles. Um, where are we in this one? <laughs> That's maybe a good way of introducing it. I've been th through a few cycles, and uh, my cycles in precious metals, as uh, someone who's recommending them, started right at 2000 at the low, uh, when I was sort of of the view that the NASDAQ would crash in 2000, and what are we all going to do about it? I was a long only manager at the time, and um, I did some work on it, and it, it looked like gold would be the answer. And I also, even back then, believed that uh, the DOS was broke. The uh, uh, un accrued, unaccrued liabilities were excessive, which they certainly are today. And, you know, everything that Luke's already discussed would suggest that, you know, we have a problem. And I always think of it as the Minsky moment when the debts just get so large that the interest costs can't be dealt with. So uh, with that in mind, I think gold is a solution. And I've always thought all that time I, that I was involved with gold and silver, I always thought the, the markets were manipulated, the, the precious metals markets. And there's lots of evidence of that subsequently. Um, one of the more interesting documents that I got onto early was a, a gentleman named Frank Veneroso wrote a big gold book suggesting that the Western central banks were suppressing the price of gold. And I totally believe it. Uh, it wasn't a very widely read book, but it was incredibly helpful. I've been a supporter of the, the GATA group, the Gold Antitrust Association, Bill Murphy, uh, Chris Powell, and Ed Steer, uh, and they've written about it constantly. And I think it's probably more people are beginning to accept it. Uh, in fact, one of the instances where I think it might have manifested itself recently was as I look at what happened on the last day of March, and the price of silver would just look like it wanted to go when it was being suppressed. And of course, I'm a sitting here assuming that the guys who are short the 800 billion ounces of silver on the COMEX didn't want the price to explode for quarter end, which of course is very important to banking institutions. And needless to say, from that day on, silver has basically gone straight up. And I think it's in reaction to the fact that, okay, we it's not quarter end anymore. Maybe we all have to face this again in June, but uh, I think it is manipulated. Um, one of the... Uh, there's a number of factors that take me to that, particularly in silver now. And I'm so happy that uh, Michael Oliver is on the line and it will be, I'm glad he didn't give us his uh, forecast of where the prices would go yet. <laughs> and, and and I'm glad that Pierre hasn't come on and give us his prices, the forecast of prices yet. Otherwise, everyone would be off the call. <laughs> <dealing with that. laughs> <Okay. laughs> there, there's more important things to do than listen to us. Okay, <laughs> One of them is action. Um, but as, as I look at silver, uh, we're all aware that there was a 200 million ounce shortfall of between demand and supply last year. Nobody believes the Silver Institute numbers. I don't believe the Silver Institute numbers are probably very, very wrong. Uh, the fact that the the short position in SLB keeps exploding here, 
India, oh my God, in February, they bought 76 million ounces of silver. 76 million is about all the production in the world in one in that month. And they just announced March, they uh, imported 32 million ounces of silver. I mean, these are gigantic numbers. Uh, I, they suggest that the reason for the numbers is that they're going to have a huge solar expansion. Mm -hmm. And one of the unique things about solar is it would seem that a solar panel with twice as much silver as we used to put in it is way more efficient than the former one. Therefore, the use of silver in, in solar panels will go up. We've also seen the inventory of COMEX LBMA uh, decline. Uh, we had a recent situation, actually literally in the last week, where apparently China has come out in advertisements on TV suggesting that their citizens should buy silver rather than gold. Now that is a rather dramatic could be a rather dramatic thing when you think of the 1.4 billion people over there all buying silver, of which there is already a shortage. Uh, one of the things that's misled most of the market participants here is we see these ETF uh, uh, units outstanding shrinking. I believe that that is the dealers who are short silver and gold using the ETF for redemption purposes to deliver into the COMEX. That's my interpretation of the whole thing. Uh, they're just being raided for delivery. And of course, no one ever talks about it because it would be a weird thing for the mainstream media to discuss. Why would these guys be redeeming units of the silver ETF when it trades like 140 million shares a day? That's sort of, it's just almost beyond belief that those things should happen. Um, I'm with the... Uh, it's very helpful for me to have a guy like Michael Oliver around who who looks at things in a different fashion than I look at it. And uh, he's sitting there thinking that the silver is going to be pretty exciting. I'm sure he'll tell you a little more about it. Um, but I'm now focusing, I'm going to focus on silver here. I have lots of silver investments, obviously. But I think silver is going to be where it is. And I would uh, urge everyone to stay till the end of this podcast to find out where it's really going to go, because it will be exciting. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Eric, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to invite Pierre Lassonde. Uh, he's got a junior mining uh, development curve named after him. He's uh, he's the founder of arguably the most successful precious metal companies ever, Franco Nevada. And uh, Pierre, I believe it's a, a milestone special day for you today. Yes, it is. It's uh, my birthday, actually. And uh, it's uh, two lucky numbers, you know, which uh, I can't even believe it myself. But yeah, 77 years old, believe it or not. Um, and with that, I will uh, go right into uh, the, I, because of my age, I had the, uh, the, the, the chance or the opportunity to live through the 70s. And what we're seeing today to my mind is not a whole lot different than what we saw particularly in the late 70s um I, you're looking at you know the uh, the fed is talking about sticky inflation well it's very sticky and part of the reason of course is because you're looking at like you know two trillion dollar deficit in the us a year you're looking at the debt going up I mean, that was all mentioned before and uh, they're they're printing the money, and so when you're printing money, you're going to create inflation, and it's going to be very very sticky. Uh, so um, the uh, you know what I find interesting, I guess, is Voltaire, the the French philosopher, said history doesn't repeat itself, but man does. And uh, if you one of the chart that I have used over the past you know 20, 30, years is the Dow Jones Industrial Average divided by the gold price. It's a ratio of essentially financial asset vis-a-vis -vis hard asset. Um, you can just go on Google, look it up. It's very easy. Um, it's, you know, like a ton of people I've, I've used it since I've been using it, I think since 1985. And what you see, if you look at that chart over a 120 year period, you see, you know, 30, 40 years where you want to be in financial asset. Attention, please. Attention, please. Okay. Someone is going to get like thrown out here. You know, is there's a red button, you're going to get ejected. Um, <laughs> what you see, <laughs> what you see is 
uh, there, there are like times where you want to be in, in hard asset. And what's interesting about that ratio, and um, there I'm going to talk to uh, Eric once I, you know, I talk about my gold price forecast and might as well close down the, we the, the webinar. Um, twice in the last 120 years, that ratio has essentially come down to one to one. And it happened in 1934 when the Dow went from, in 1929, the Dow was over 380 and it went down to 36. It lost 90% of its value in five years. It bought them at 36. And gold, which had been $25 an ounce for the past like 50 years, got revalued to uh, $35 an ounce. So essentially it was like one to one. Then you have the same thing that happened in 1980. The Dow actually topped out in 1966 at 1,000. And then for the next 14 years, drifted down to 600 before coming back up to 800 in 1980. Well, gold, which had been $35 an ounce until 71, when Nixon in August 71, you know, reneged on the gold standard, gold went from $35 to 180, then it backed down during the recession of 1974, 76 to $90. And then it went from $90 to $800 in 1980. And in January, 1980, you had a Dow at 800 and gold at $800. So with that being said, the Dow today is 37,750, you know, do I believe it's going to go back to one to one? Maybe, but maybe at that point, the Dow is not 37,000. It may be half of that. Okay. So if you say, you know, say it goes back to two to one and the Dow stays where it is, well, that's still like close to $19,000 gold. And if the Dow goes back down to 20,000 and it goes to one to one, well, you're still looking at $20,000 gold. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the length of time between 1934 and 1980, that was 46 years. And if you take 1980 and add 46 years, that's 2026. Okay. Now that's like being saying, uh, well, the average man lives to be 80 years old, while some live to, yeah, you know, 90 and others at like seven. Uh, well, we're already closer to the average age here of that bull market and whatever it is, it's like 46. So am I, you know, being bullish on gold uh, for the next few years? A hundred percent. Absolutely. hundred um, percent. The, the, the U S you know, financial affairs remind me of uh, you know, a quote from Hemingway. He was asked him, how did you go bankrupt? He said two ways gradually then suddenly and that's really what the u.s is all about like you know it's a gradual bankruptcy and then all of a sudden you're going to be it's going to be in your face the dollar is going to crash and gold is the anti-us dollar when the dollar performs its uh, function of reserve of uh, last currency uh you don't need gold but when it doesn't that's when gold usually shines and uh, I, you know, you're looking at the world today. The world wants to de-dollarize. The, the U.S. has weaponized the U.S. dollar. Uh, they're closing down the, uh, av the availability of exchange of banking uh, to a whole bunch of countries. And the countries of the world are saying like, well, you know, why do we get run around by the U.S.? We want to have our own system. And I think that was expressed earlier as well. And that de-dollarization is manifested by central bank buying. Uh, last year, central banks bought over 1,200 tons of gold uh, in a market, the total gold market, the, the total new production is 3,400. So a third of all production, more than a third, was bought just by central banks. Um, and uh, when it comes down to equity, when it comes down to buying, this is another interesting point. You, you have three different forms of buying gold. Um, you can buy the bullion, you can buy uh, and you can buy gold equities, but the gold equities are separated in what I would call the royalty companies, which are 
in between the bullion and equities. And you can buy, you know, the, the operating company, which would be gold equities per se. And when you talk about gold equities, are they financial instrument or are they gold, are they hard asset instrument? I think this is a distinction that th this current market is uh, looking into because you see there's a huge disparity between where the gold price is and the value of the gold equities. I mean, they're the gold equities are trading as if gold was about, you know, $1,600. Gold this morning was $2,400. You know, like the margin that these companies are going to provide are enormous. And yet the stocks are barely, barely moving. Uh, so you accept the, uh, the uh, royalty companies are doing better. So... It's interesting to me that uh, if you want torque, you go in the equities because that's where you're going to have the biggest bang for your buck. But when you look at the gold market today, who's buying uh, the, the, the gold market is the, is the family offices. It's the, uh, the, the people that are buying physical gold and putting it in the vault. And that is their insurance against uh, deterioration of the U.S. dollar. And we're seeing that in, you know, like in, in a major way. But we're also in China, like uh, the first two months of this year, uh, in, gold import through Hong Kong were 372 tons. If you annualize that, that's two thirds of all the gold produced this year is going into Hong Kong. That is absolutely incredible. And... Uh, I've been saying for a while that the gold price at the end of the day is going to be set on the Shanghai Gold Exchange because that's where the majority of the physical gold is going to be traded. It's not going to be anymore on the COMEX or London. It's going to be in Shanghai. And the Shanghai Gold Exchange is going to turn into a casino because um, the, the Chinese have an incredible propensity to gamble. And, uh, you know, if they're out of the real estate market, they don't have the ability to invest in crypto that's been banned in China. So what else have you got? Gold. And that is what's happening over there. And I think it's just going to get better over the next two years. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, we'll, we'll come back and I've got some follow-up questions to ask you about your favorite stock picks. But before we do that, uh, Ned, Ned Leyland, uh, when I described the three billionaires, you were the third managing other people's money. Um, Ned, possibly the most bullish man I know on the English side of the Atlantic Ocean, um, with Eric being the most bullish silver bull on the other side. What are your views, Ned? Where are we in this cycle? Well, firstly, Simon, thanks for the invitation. And um, apologies for the intervention from the mainstream financial system there that we had briefly. <laughs> Obviously, a huge, huge coincidence that that happened on this call. Um, Look, I, I think that um, it feels like a kind of festival of parables at the moment, that everything is kind of playing out all at once. And I think we have we have a slight problem in our area of, of the cry wolf thing, whereby, you know, we've all been talking about the same thing for a long time. It's now obviously happening. Um, indeed, the, the dollar gold price is reflecting the fact that we've, we've got through the, um, the, the dollar bull versus gold, uh, probably depending on how you want to look at it, 44 year period. And we're now in a dollar bear versus gold period. And and so far we're just in the stealth phase and no one's doing it. I can tell you the one thing I can add is that I meet a lot of a lot of um potential investors and institutional investors. Um and there's been there's more interest and, and I'm quite busy at the moment, but you're not seeing um any participation really it's very much a kind of that classic stealth phase at the beginning of a of a of a big secular change where people are sort of going mm, something's happening here i'm not sure what's going on um and i think partly it's because it's not down to us um you know personally sort of pointing something out but i think people have, have heard the story about monetary degradation and potentially monetary collapse for long periods and they've not seen it or not or not recognized it so at the moment, I think we're in a very interesting period where we're, 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 we're through that moment. Um, and, and I'm very much of the view that, you know, gold is just gold. It, it's just pricing everything. It's it's just the risk free. And if you want to wear physical gold, you're, you're disinvesting. Therefore, really, what we've seen is um, a recognition in the fixed interest market, actually, that owning long 
long um, bonds, which and, and Michael touched on and, and Luke as well, long treasuries. That's what's really shifted dramatically in the last sort of month, two months. There's a recognition that um, alongside Turkish lira, yen, sterling, euros and everything else, people don't want to hold um, US sovereign debt long either. And that, of course, is a huge deal because only two things are risk free in this system. One, one is the real risk free and the other is um, US treasuries. And the problem, of course, for investors is that everything they hold, everything they price is assuming that US government debt is risk free. Now, that is um, um, profoundly worrying for, for most people when they recognize that, which is starting to happen. And, and obviously quite exciting for those of us that are positioned in the other direction to benefit from a shift in capital flows. But from my perspective, what you've seen so far is, is an FX move. Um, you know, it's not really a flow driven situation. In mind, of course, the stuff about um, the physical market in China is super interesting. And I'd love to hear from Eric what he thinks about, about how the silver market is clearing at the moment. I find it baffling where the physical is coming from to to make up that gap. I mean, no one has a sensible answer for it. I mean, I know what he said about SLB, but but overall, it's still, I think the maths don't 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 match. Um, it's remarkable. We haven't seen the squeeze yet in, in, in silver, which I do feel very strongly will happen. And probably once we get through 30 and, and start sort of gapping high, you might see, see a bit more of that. Um, but I think beyond that, what I would say to do in mining actually, which of course, as you know, Simon, is what mainly what we do. Um, I like the silver story more than the gold story. I mean, gold is great, and 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 I own lots of gold miners, and they are they will be free cash flow monsters in due course. But when I look at the fact that that even sell side recognise that silver will be a hundred percent in balance, so let's say one point five billion ounces of demand versus eight hundred million of supply, or, or or something like that by twenty thirty, um, and that doesn't include any material shift in. Um, investment demand, by the way, that's that's so that's simply the run rate to do with solar, uh, electronics, etc. You know, and that's why a lot of it's going into India. When I look at that, my view is recognize something that's obvious, and and how can one best benefit from that? Well, my view is is silver development assets. You know, they are crazy cheap still. No one, no one's interested. It's very much a <laughs> a fringe and unloved, hated even subset of the global equity market. Uh, you've had to be very patient to be there and know why you're there. Um, but allied with the opportunity in physical gold, physical silver, and, and, and royalty companies producing gold assets, I think that the, the market at some point will have to understand that the silver is going to come from somewhere. Um, and then I, I see that as the best, most obvious way um, that investors can benefit from a, from a big re-rating for the mining equity uh, space. But the thing is, you know, people say to me, obviously, people say to me, we, we kind of understand gold and silver, but the gold and silver mining stocks, they, they suck. You know, they're just awful over every time frame I look at. They're just appalling. And the answer is, I think, is quite simple, which is, but, you know, we've been in a bear market for, for gold versus dollars since 1980. So anything we've seen is a counter trend rally. It's, it's a bear market rally. And the mining equities are super sensitive to flow. They're not like it's they're not FX. You know they need people coming in. That's how they move. Um, and so while we've had short periods where they've done well, it's been very much a short term sugar high bear market rally. Um, so yeah, they've been very difficult to hold. But if we're right that this will, you know, that the, the thesis is right that we've entered a bull market for the true risk free versus the pseudo risk free, which is certainly my my view of things then I think we can see bull market conditions for gold and silver mining equities, whereby you will see flow, and it should be relatively consistent once it starts, partly due to FOMO, which is people will be, you know, dragged in as they seem to be in all sorts of other things nowadays. Um, but I think we're, 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 we're pretty close to a point where you will start to see that flow happen. I'm not surprised it hasn't happened so far because retail's gone. Uh, asset allocators aren't there. I, I, I expect over the coming weeks, we start to see a slightly better outcome as, as Q1 reallocations into Q2s percolate a little bit into, into flow. Uh, there's always a lag that doesn't happen within 17 days at the start of the quarter, despite the fact you might think it would. It takes a bit of time. So I think that that will start to happen. 
Um, but, you know, this year is set up um, well, and I think it's timely for us to discuss all this. Thank you, Ned. Um, Eric, maybe I can uh, pick uh, direct Ned's question on silver to you, and maybe you can give us a comment on your favorite silver or gold ideas in terms of stock selection. Ned's question was, what will actually cause this silver market to break higher? And if the your point was, if the ETFs are shrinking, um, how does ultimately how does that ultimately resolve itself? Is it a bullion bank going broke, or, or what? What do you think? Well, there's no doubt that the bullion banks have to cover their shorts. And when you think of the the, the call position of a billion ounces, the 800 million short on the, on the COMEX, God knows what's going on on the LBMA, but uh, you got to believe there's all kinds of shorts there too. And it's it's so disproportionate to the size of the silver market. I mean, we only mine about 800 million ounces a year, and each one of those factors is bigger than that already. And I think what will happen is the price will explode. I'm, I fear, I fear that the COMEX might want to change the rules. That's one of the things I fear. Uh, you know, it's happened before. In fact, the last time the silver went to 30, even the, the uh, head of the CFTC said, well, we had to tamp it down. And, uh, you know, well, why do you have to tamp down the silver price? I mean, why can't we just have a normal market, okay? so. I don't know what's going to happen here, but I think we're going to have an explosion in the shorts having to cover. The, the silver shorts are already down $5 billion in the last six weeks, $5 billion. The uh, gold shorts are down $17 billion. Now, the last time I looked, $22 billion was a lot of money to some of these people, and it, it hasn't stopped going up yet. So something's going to break in the system here. Hmm. And, and Eric, uh, for the audience, uh, how should they position themselves in, in which companies, gold or silver developers or producers? Well, I, I mostly own um, explorers who have known deposits that are struggling to bring them into production. And, you know, in a, in a way I say, well, let's see now, what would happen if the price of silver was 50? What would this company's uh, silver in the ground be worth? You know, somebody's got 800 million ounces of silver. What would it be worth at $50 silver? And it'd be worth like 20 or 30 times what it's trading at. Well, okay, I'm willing to take, that's a fair bet for me to make that kind of return. Uh, you could also do it by owning producers. Unfortunately, producers in both gold and silver are having a tough time, you know, producing much product. There have been so many disappointments in the production levels of silver in particular uh, that you always have these these problems in the market. And of course, let alone the geopolitical problems that they, they encounter from time to time here. So um, that's where I'm positioned. I, I, I'm also a big owner of silver myself. Uh, I own calls on the SLV. Um, as far out as, let's say, January, I own some for June too. So I'm really hoping that things break. Well, they've already broken up. Yeah, they've broken up here. I mean, it's been a wonderful rally here. And I think uh, when you realize what should happen here in the very short term, that uh, there'll be a lot, there should be a lot of action in silver here shortly. And any, uh, any particular names you want to mention or not, Eric? Well, I, I, the names of silver uh, companies that I have the biggest investment in, there's Discovery Solar, there is Chesapeake Gold. Uh, there's uh, Highcroft Mining. All of these are guys with hundreds of millions of ounces of silver that are waiting for a turn in the price in order to advance their project. But I suspect that once it once the price is obvious, that we're obviously in a bull market. I think there'll be a lot of money made available to these companies so they can get into production. So those are the kind of names I prefer. Thank you. Uh, Pierre, maybe I can ask you, you've made your career on uh, building mining companies. Uh, what do you think is the next Franco Nevada? Well, the, the business model of the royalty company is unique in the world. And, you know, uh, I think it's one of the best business model ever. Uh, not because I, you know, I invented it uh, because it, I mean, I was lucky to figure it all out. Uh, but when you have revenues of like US 1.2 billion and 42 employees, uh, you can see like how incredibly 
um, in weld creation uh, it is. And, uh, you know, I was listening to Eric here about uh, what he likes to buy. What he likes to buy is uh, free optionality. And uh, that's really what, you know, like to me, there's two forms of optionality. There's price optionality, which is what Eric was talking about. And there's land optionality, uh, which is what the natural resources offers you. And if you can buy an asset and get both form of optionality for free, I guarantee you, I'll make you very wealthy. And that's the whole basis of Franco Nevada, because when we buy a royalty on a piece of land, uh, with uh, let's say a million ounce of reserve, well, uh, immediately we get free price optionality on a million ounce of gold. And then as the operator, you know, starts to drill around, we get free optionality on any discovery. And so with that kind of optionality, it's, it's worth far more. The, the, the interesting thing in our business, natural resource business is that uh, analysts and the the even the mining companies don't know how to price optionality and therefore they just don't account for it and yet it's what made me wealthy and made the franco nevada shareholders wealthy and that's what i like to buy um, you know where i try to position myself and my family office is if you look at the lasson curve i like to buy things in what i call the killing fields uh, where the, uh, the, the deposit has been drilled to death, uh, you know the cost uh, that it's going to cost to build, you, you know, and uh, they're trying to find the financing to put it together. And usually you can buy um, the companies at you know, a, a huge discount to their net asset value of what is there, and you get free optionality on both the land discovery and on price discovery. And, uh, you know, uh, Orla, which is, you know, the company that started like five years ago, was one of those companies. We, we bought the asset for 36 million. We built a company on it today that's worth like 1.2 billion. And uh, we put up the money, we passed the hat around to, you know, create, to um, find the financing to build the mine. And today we're sitting on, I don't know, like 12, 14 million ounces of gold. and. Like it, it keeps on giving great deposits. Just keep on, keep on giving. Um, the other part of the spectrum that I dabble in, but I'm very careful is uh, the, uh, the very early stage exploration, uh, but with people that I trust and uh, with geology that is giving. And uh, on that score, um, I have two of my favorite would be uh, Southern Cross in Australia. Uh, which uh, is, I think, is uh, looking at a Fosterville lookalike. Uh, if you look at their, their drilling, like 400 meters of like, you know, seven gram, nine gram. I mean, those numbers are like really unbelievable. And yet the, the Australian market is yawning at them. This is like, you know, no, this is like, you know, it's Ballarat, it's Bendigo. It's just going to be like, you know, a little pod. Maybe it will be, but it's getting bigger in the meantime, and it's still way underpriced. So I like that, and I like the management. They really, they really know what they're doing. And in Mexico, prime mining is the same thing. It's a uh, you know like we bought this; it had seven hundred fifty thousand ounce of resource. Now it's closing in on like you know four million, and uh, that optionality of land has been incredible for you know value creation. Those are the situations I like. And of course, Franco Nevada. I mean, if you, if you want to be in, uh, you know, like apart from gold bullion, if you want to be in the space and you be like the safest asset, uh, notwithstanding Panama, okay? Like, you know, that, it's a little hiccup. I think it will get resolved, but it's, it, it goes to show that, you know, you have to have diversification in the business. If you put all your eggs in one company with only one asset, you can get wiped out very fast uh, because of political reason, because of mining engineering reason, construction, all kinds of reason. And uh, I think there's been a lot of wipeout over the last 10 years and a lot of shareholders have just gone, you know, gun shy by, by, you know, management screwing it up, like very simply put. And uh, I understand them. So you, 
you really have to be careful. And if you don't know what you're doing, you know, put your money with a trusted fund manager who knows what they're doing. That's my advice to the novice. Okay. Like don't try to pick that one exploration or that, you know, like, uh, or, you know, or follow someone who's done it like, you know, like a hundred times, but like it, this is not for novice period. Thank you, Pierre. Um, if any of the panelists have questions for each other, I invite you to, to speak up. Um, I've got a, a a bunch of questions coming through on the on the uh, Q and A from the audience here. Pierre, just a further clarification: What is your prognosis of the Cobra in Panama situation? Asks Ravi Jain. Uh, there is a an election for a new president uh, in a couple of weeks, and the uh, the three candidates that are running, uh, all three are sensible individual. There is a solution that will be found, I believe, but it's going to take uh, probably two to three years before the uh, the mine reopens. Uh, but the mine creates 40,000 jobs, 5% of the GDP of the country. It's a critical metal. Uh, you need copper. If, uh, To my mind, the only critical metal in, uh, in the world is copper. Uh, everything else, the battery technology will evolve, but you're always going to need copper to transport your electricity. And uh, I think that the uh, both the company and uh, the, the company is at, at fault. Uh, they really did not understand uh, the uh, uh, the value of uh, participation uh, with the, the people there. They just thought we write a check and we're good, but there's far more than that. And uh, the, the people thought that the whole process had been corrupt because there's corruption uh, in Panama. Uh, the former president went to jail uh, for corruption. So, you know, like it's, it's, a, it's a fact of life. But I do believe that the situation will get resolved. And I think if you think of uh, most people who know things, so something about Panama will tell you the same thing. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Eric, the most prominent question I've got a number of times here is, can you please give the name of the book that you mentioned to that refers about the manipulation of the metals market? Well, it's actually a book that I don't think is published. It was published then. I think there might have been like 100 copies at the most, but it was called The 1998 Gold Book by Frank Vanaroso. It's a very large book. It's about a foot and a half high and had about 200 pages in it. Uh, it's, it's, it's obviously dated because it was just setting up the topic of, oh, by the way, you might think the gold market is, is a fairly traded market. It isn't. And that's really what got me started in realizing that, you know, we had a lot more upside here than we might have given it credit to because we've probably been manipulated for the last 45 years. Yeah, I think I read in the last week, Eric, uh, in The Greed and Fear, the excellent uh, weekly from Christopher Walker that um, Volker apparently said that it was in the interest of the uh, US government to manage the gold market down so people didn't think that was a real alternative to the dollar. Um, Ned, did I see you with your hand up earlier? Yeah, I, I was just keen to to ask Michael about um, about his analysis of the gold silver ratio. It's, I think it's a, a an interesting subject to sort of probe at the, on the fringe on because obviously he'll have his projections on gold and on silver individually. But I, I wonder whether you apply MSA to the the ratio. I mean, bearing in mind Pierre's what was it nineteen thousand um, <laughs> dollar postulation? I won't call it a, a, a prediction. Um, mm -hmm. Um, with a gold silver ratio maybe uh, twenty, that's coming up with quite a fancy number. I'm just wondering what Michael's um, service is, or, or if you look at that at all. I look at it all the time. So I think that's the most important variable right now, and it's just now breaking out. By the way, <clears throat> since we made our high in the summer of 2020, that surge silver beat gold handily percent wise. Okay, so in early 2021, the silver versus gold situation shifted against silver, started to staircase back down. And we measured a little bit differently than the, the common way. What we do is divide the price of silver into the price of gold to get a percent. Okay. If you go back over the last 50 years and look at the highest reading on a monthly close of silver versus gold, you'll see there was one time it was six and a half percent of the price of gold. That was back, you know, early in the 1970s, 80s. Uh, but in repeated instances, some of which are associated with the bull markets in the net price, 
Silver as a percent of gold has gone up to two and a half percent. You could say almost routinely. In other words, it's not some rarity. You look on 50 years of data and find one instance. You find multiple times where silver will get up to two and a half, even 3% the price of gold. Right now, it's 1.2% of the price of gold. We measured the action since early 2020. Month by month, we plot the spread between the silver price and the gold price, close of the month. Okay, And there's a beautiful downtrend structure that's been developed since that surge that out of the 2019 hole into the 2020-21 highs. That spread had a beautiful five-point downtrend line that's being broken out this month. So the silver gold spread is telling us, okay, silver is not only turning up in price with drama that we've seen recently, but it's causing the spread to break out in its relationship to gold. Same is occurring in the miners. The, you know, well, silver drifted down, the miners got hammered down on, on a percentage basis while gold effectively went sideways. So you know, everybody gave up on the miners. They're no good, you know, they're never going up. Okay, well, the spread says now it's time. We, we measure GDX each month close versus gold, and it's breaking out of a similar structure that silver has. So I think both the spreads are turning up. It's, and that happens to be important because that similar type of behavior, especially by silver, is coincident with the late acceleration phases in the net price of the bull trends, such as in 1979 to 80. Not only did the net price of silver beat gold handily, but the spread exploded and also in 2010, in the last year or so of that bull market. The spread is now breaking out, therefore it's giving a thumbs up to what we see is the net technicals of gold and silver that they're entering an acceleration phase. The spread says, yes, we agree, but this time by miners, by, by silver, as opposed to gold. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um... Luke Bromman, a question for you. It, given that the central banks are buying gold because it's now become the de facto reserve currency for the BRICS Plus, um, do you have a view on silver's role as a monetary metal, or is it more of a about its industrial demand for solar panels? I think the I'm bullish on silver. I think it will be a monetary metal for the masses, and I think that is what you're starting to see when you when you refer to what, what Michael just just laid out. Uh, in terms of the fiscal situation of the reserve currency issuer, the US and uh, the West more broadly, uh, I think gold will play the primary role there simply because silver is not on the uh, not on the central bank's balance sheet. And so effectively, when you have central banks buying gold, uh, the price of gold going up recapitalizes their balance sheet relative to the rest of the assets on their books, which tend to be long duration bonds uh, that decline in value as, as, as rates rise and as inflation rises. And so I don't think central banks will buy silver simply because of the industrial use. In other words, uh, if they did so, particularly in the context of global climate EV electrification initiatives, it would be highly counterproductive for them to try to deflate sovereign debt against silver, because now you're talking about taking silver to prices uh, that make solar panels uneconomic relative to fossil fuels, that make iPhones uneconomic relative to masses of the people and cre they create an inflation problem and make it worse. Silver is actually used for something. Most of the time you hear gold isn't used for anything as a derogatory comment. And most of the time that is true and it is derogatory. But for a, the brief period in the long debt cycle, the fact that debt or the gold isn't used for anything is exactly why it's so valuable. You can write gold up to 20,000 an ounce, 50,000 an ounce, 100,000 an ounce. You're going to be moving some capital flows around that will have some derivative impacts in terms of inflation expectations, relative currency values, but nobody's going to starve to death. If you take oil up from $80 a barrel to $400 a barrel, 
the global bond market's going to collapse and the bottom half of global population is going to starve. If you did so with corn, if you did so with wheat, uh, to Pierre's point, if you did so with copper, same sort of dynamic. Those are very useful commodities. And so for silver, half of it, half of the demand is, is useful. It's industrial demand. It's needed for electrification, for, for the climate, uh, for the uh, 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 energy shift. And so if central banks bid silver to delever their own debt problems, uh, it's, it's, it's anti, it's basically anti-human. Um, you're going to collapse the economy, not fix it. So I think gold will serve a role of devaluing or deflating debt on central bank balance sheets, recapping them. I think silver will benefit immensely. I think silver will serve as a monetary metal for the masses. Uh, but that's how I think about the two of them vis-a-vis -vis central banks. Uh, and a follow-up question, Luke. Is it, in your view, in the interest of the U.S. government to devalue the dollar against gold or push up the U.S. dollar gold price? Yes, I do think it is. Okay. And do you think that there's any particular time uh, period over which it would make sense for the U.S. government to push up the U.S. dollar gold price? I think we might be in that period. Um, when I look back, I see the meeting between Xi and Biden in November as possibly having laid out the bones of a, what we call a San Francisco Accord uh, to weaken the dollar. Um, and we've seen meetings, repeated treasury meetings since, obviously, Janet Yellen was over there a couple of weeks ago. And it's always the same message out of these meetings. We're worried about too cheap of Chinese goods. Well, consensus is that the yuan is going to have to be devalued. But if America is concerned about cheap Chinese goods and the Chinese are running record 30 year record manufacturing surpluses, record near record current account surpluses with the world, they don't need a cheaper yuan. A cheaper yuan is just going to make their surpluses more and make their goods cheaper. What America needs is a weaker dollar. But I strongly suspect and you can see evidence of this, you know, just by searching the topic. Uh, I think the conversation probably went something like Janet Yellen said to the Chinese, we would like for you to revalue the yuan higher against the dollar, not too different from the 1985 Plaza Accord. And I think the Chinese said something like, uh, had this conversation taken place, we saw what happened to Japan from 1989 through just recently, three lost decades. As a result of the Plaza Accord, there is zero chance that we, China, are going to revalue the yuan higher against the dollar. If you would like the dollar lower against the yuan, you need to bid the price of gold, Janet Yellen, Jerome Powell, and so I, I think, I don't know if we're quite there yet, but I think there is a recognition building in Washington that once you get the price of gold high enough that it starts to really compete with the treasury market and really starts to force the Fed into yield curve control, QE, et cetera, to deal with the supplies um, of, of treasury issuance, then the dollar will really meaningfully start to weaken. And the trends we've seen to date in gold, I think, really get turbocharged at that point. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, a question for any of the panelists. I've had a number of questions about different metals. Uh, are there any metals which the panelists, I heard, Pierre, you say you like copper is essential. Other metals that you think are worth talking about, apart from gold, silver, for example, copper or the platinum group metals? None for me. Copper at our end, uh, we broke out a while ago on long-term momentum. I think the Bloomberg Commodity Index also is about to go into another major up leg, which is going to be very troublesome for the Fed, uh, because that means their other, you know, their mandate to fight inflation, they're going to be contradicted by unemployment problems soon. I think when that stock market goes down, but copper is contributing to an overall commodity upturn, and it looks technically quite strong right now for probably take out the highs that we saw at five. And so, Michael, when you look at the different metals, copper versus precious or any other metals or commodities, is precious the most bullish or not? Monetary metals, yes. Uh, I don't use the word precious. I would apply that to platinum and palladium. Right. And, they're, you know, they're more industrial. And palladium used to compete with gold. You know, people used to think of it as an alternative. And there were times where it moved with gold. That has not been the case for the last several years. In fact, Bloom, uh, you look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index, meaning grain, sugar, cocoa, all that stuff. Platinum moves more with that 
than it does with gold. Uh, and so it's behaving more like just a broad commodity complex. It's not behaving like a monetary metal, which it's not. Uh, so, and frankly, it's positives are, are modest at best right now. Uh, they're, they're positive, but uh, modest. Palladium being more industrial, uh, it has its own unique problems and therefore its technicals are not even quite what the Bloomberg Commodity Index is. Uh, it, it might be trying to bottom here, but we, we see nothing dynamic about it. Uh, so we're, we're focused on the monetary metals, period. Uh, a question which comes up on the um, the Q&A is uh, gold, silver versus Bitcoin. Has anyone got a view on uh, crypto versus gold and silver? Anybody? I, I have. Go ahead, Luke. You, you were I was to just going to say, I like Bitcoin. I Crypto is a separate issue for me. I don't <clears throat> dabble in or recommend crypto, but Bitcoin for me is a neutral reserve asset uh with an energy link the proof of work algorithm means you have to expend energy uh to both create and maintain the network and that to me it's that energy link that proof of work that i think is so important so i think bitcoin will also do well in what i discussed earlier and i'll i'll turn the floor over to you michael no i i sort of disagree uh, tentatively uh Bitcoin has the virtue that it can't infinitely expand immediately. It's not like a fiat currency. Okay, that's a virtue. It's negative, though, in this environment that we're about to face. And I think, again, the political issue has to be brought in, political turmoil, uncertainty as to what, what is going on. Okay. Uh, government sees crypto as a threat to their control of the money supply and the money control of the money. So if Bitcoin ever became let's say 10% of the daily transactions that people use at stores and so forth. And if you go on Google, type that in, you'll find the number of stores of major name and reputation that accept Bitcoin is amazing. I, it shocked me, frankly. Uh, now, I don't, you know, if it ever get up to 10% of the daily consumption, that would be a threat to the government control over the money supply. That's too big of a percent. So they would come up with some excuse some martial act to, to control or, or suppress it. Uh, some governments already do. Uh, and we've used excuses like, well, you use too much energy. We got to investigate that. Or it's used for laundering money, you know, all these fabrications. Uh, but the real threat is it's, it could be a threat to them. Therefore, in this crisis that I think we're approaching, the central bank is going to be extremely nervous about anything like that competing with them. They can't do that to gold. Well, remember, though, that in 1934, they did it to gold. They confiscated all the gold yes. of the citizen in the United yeah. States. Yeah. So if you don't think today they couldn't do that, but no. if you think they can't do it to crypto, think again, because you're absolutely right, Michael. I think they will do it just like the Chinese did in China. They banned crypto, pure mm -hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest threat. Yeah. And I, I think you've got to watch the NASDAQ 100 right now and compare it day to day, week to week to Bitcoin. I think you'll find a surprising uh, linkage. Yeah. Uh, recently, you know, what did we just do? NASDAQ just had a good drop, 5% or so off its high. Bitcoin dropped uh, what uh, from 72,000 to 62,000 at the same yeah. time. Interesting. Yeah, I, I Googled that and I also noticed there was a 99.0% correlation between Bitcoin and NVIDIA. <laughs> Um, uh, a question for any of the panelists and summarizes a few of the questions that we've got on the chat. Um, any view on whether we have a war premium in the price of gold and silver and any view on the outcome of the US election on whether it's Republicans or Democrats for gold or silver? Um, I, I can start with that one. There's uh, for sure there is a premium in the gold price because of uh, particularly the Middle East situation. Uh, how much of a premium? 10% maybe? I don't think it would be uh, much above that. Um, there is something funny going on in the gold world today. Like uh, there is a, a big whale uh, that's uh, uh, buying calls. And, um, in uh, gold, yeah. Yeah, in the gold world. Yeah, there's a whale buying calls. <clears throat> And uh, the banks, as the gold price moves up, the banks have to cover uh, their their call their their call uh, sell, and so they have to buy gold. And the more they buy, this whale fronts run them with uh, you know buying calls at higher prices, and it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. 
Uh, so I'm a bit worried uh, because the physical market has been drying out. Like, you know, Gold Eagles, for example, the sales are down 94% last month. Um, <clears throat> so the, the physical market in the U.S. is like really, really slow down. Same in Australia, same in Europe. Uh, but the uh, over the market, over the counter, the OTC market, the, the call market uh, is is hotter than a pistol and it's being driven by, you know, at this point, like all we can call it is a whale. Now, is you know, I don't think it's a central bank uh, because uh, central banks, they go on the London market. They uh, they never, you know, like drive the the price up they, they they're like they when it comes down they got a price they buy very different style of buying um, is it you know chinese interests that are doing this i don't know like nobody knows i've, I've asked around nobody knows so but it's a very interesting time in the, the gold space right now hmm. simon yes Ned. just just i mean from my perspective sort of seeing lots of clients around the world what I would say is I think that, that there is important to just recognize that there's a lot there's, there's a lot more dominance from um, large trend following pools now than was the case before. And when you see when you see a very, very long term breakout above 2150, which is, I think, the level, I mean, Michael would know better than me, but that's where it looked like to me for a long period. The, the work that certainly from the people I'm talking to, what happens then is you've got full green lights on the dashboard for non um, qualitative uh, large pools of capital that saying, right, this is a go now. We want to accumulate a position. So I think there's no, there's, from my perspective, there's no doubt that that's the principal driver of, of price action at the moment. Uh, and it's not. I mean, it's interesting to hear Pierre corroborate that you know it's certainly not the um, the average show buying physical. It's just, it's just not happening, and it's certainly not happening in the in the institutional world, the asset allocation world. That's not happening, and we can see it again with the with the holdings of. The physical ETFs. It's just not with that's not where the action is. So um, I, I would say what you've seen is is it's a it's a massive shift on, in the technicals, and that's driven some momentum in, which is being very methodical in buying, which is why you're seeing this very very strong price action because they're just there um, and bidding. Hmm. Interesting. Um, a question for the all of the panelists uh, in terms of which countries you would invest in and which ones you would not invest in. Um, maybe I'll lead off. I mean, I tend to uh, be involved in uh, Canada, the U.S., uh, some in South America. Uh, but uh, I, I try to, you've got to limit where you're going here because things can happen, as we've already seen with Panama and others. So you, you better look at each situation individually. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm the same. I, I like to invest uh, north south. Uh, so anything from Canada down to Chile, um, simply for ease of uh, <clears throat> uh, getting there uh, and uh, time management. Um, so uh, the AAA countries, Canada, uh, the US, of course, uh, and then, uh, you know, Chile, Mexico, those are all fine. Uh, places where I would not go. Um, where the the corruption is uh, off the chart, uh, any of the uh, former uh, Russian uh, republic, uh, you know, like corruption off the chart. Uh, there's some places in Africa which I find I would find very difficult to go to, um, and uh, <clears throat> um, you know, some of the places Indonesia, PNG, not easy, and very very difficult to operate. Uh, I like simple things. I mean, you know, you, there's already enough risk in the, in the mining business. You don't need to add, you know, jurisdiction risk on top of that and legal risk and, you know, all kinds of other risks that uh, you can't manage. I mean, like Panama, for example, who would have thought that the Panamanian government, which is supposed, you know, to be an open country would, would ever, ever shut down a $10 billion mine. Um, it, it's uh, unthinkable. And yet it happened. So, um, you know, I, I try to manage uh, the uh, that by limiting the number of countries you go to and uh, where there's a long mining history, it, it really helps. 
Gotcha. Ned, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm three for three with them. As you know, we, 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 we restrict ourselves to the north-south, but obviously we have a big additional position in Australia being being very much sort of probably, the, in our view, the principal tier one jurisdiction. I mean, I have to see it very slightly differently in as much as what, what we're trying to do is minimise operating variables. The geopolitical thing is obviously important, but it's very difficult to predict. So taking a view on that, you're going to quite often get it wrong. I mean, for example, one of the places that, that's become more difficult is Canada. But I mean, you know, Eric will know that too. It's not exactly easy to pr pr progress projects there either. So, I mean, for us, it's about try and minimise the negative operating variables. And the best way to do that is where are the best people, um, where are the regulations the clearest, where are logistics relatively straightforward, um, as against relatively complicated. So, um, yeah, we're the same, very similar in terms of where, um, and the principal driver is to reduce operating variables rather than add complexity. Understood. Uh, now, before I ask each of you to give us your gold silver prize forecast over the next year, uh, is there any other questions that the panelists might have for each other? No? Uh, okay. Uh, why don't we go in the running order that we started the webinar? Michael, um, what do you think in gold silver over the next year? Uh, the next year should be dramatic. I'm, I'm not at all sure that'll end it. Uh, also, don't think the end of this bull market will lead to a bear. I think we'll go to a gold standard. You know, we'll reject the odd currencies b because of the nature of the crisis that evolves. Uh, but if you look at gold prior bull markets, you see sevenfold, eightfold, eightfold moves from bear market low to bull market high, bear market low to bull market high. Just repeat it. It's a habit. If we had an eightfold move right now, we'd be $8,000 gold because the last bear low was 1,050. And is that extraordinary? Absolutely not. We've done it so many times, three times before in the last 50 years. So you can throw up $8,000 gold and say it's reasonable. Well, as the silver gold ratio went to 2% to one, you know, who, who boy, <laughs> you're talking a couple hundred dollars silver. So mm. a lot of that should occur this year in terms of percentage, I think. Wow. I think we've begun that process. Now, 8,000, uh, you know, I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying it's routine ratio move. Gotcha. Um, right. Uh, Luke, have you got any gold or silver price forecasts? I, I think in the near term, you know, over the, I think we get to 3,000, I think surprisingly quickly. Uh, from a more structural standpoint, I, one way I've looked at the price of gold has been the market value of the U.S. official gold as a percent of the U.S. foreign-held treasuries outstanding. So basically, what percent is U.S. official gold at market price collateralizing the United States' as foreign debt? And at least as far back as 1970, from 1970 to 1989, that ratio was never less than 20%. It averaged around 40%. And when there were true concerns about the dollar in the late 70s, that ratio went to 135%. Now, that's a true gold bubble. That's you Conceivably, foreign holders of U.S. Treasuries could have gone to Treasury, demanded gold at the market price, and the U.S. still would have had a third of its gold left over. Uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989, we've had a steady decline in that ratio. Uh, it bottomed at about 5%. It is back up to about 7% today. So for me, uh, in addition to the other valuation metrics um, the gentleman noted, uh, I think that's a way to think about it too, as there's likely to be more concerns about uh, exactly how risk-free on a real basis U.S. Treasury debt is. Uh, you've got, just to get back to the 1989 level of 20%, where, which was, by the way, the last time the United States had a serious geopolitical adversary, uh, which we once again do, uh, you need 3x just to get there. And if you have a serious concern about the dollar ever actually er erupts as it was occurring in the late 1970s, 40%, uh, you get 6X uh, and you know 80%, you'd get 12X. So 
But the bottom line is, I think ultimately much higher prices in this cycle, given where we are in the long debt cycle and how I think those are likely to manifest and concerns about the the real risk free nature of of U.S. Uh, the inflation adjusted uh, uh, nature, risk nature of treasuries. Sorry, Luke, can I just clarify what I think you just said? I think you said that the gold price needs to go between three and eight times higher to be the right ratio backing U.S. Uh, external government debt. Yeah, exactly. Three, so six thousand, well, seventy five hundred on the low end, and and you know, in a real dollar crisis, you could go a hundred percent, right? So you'd have to go up ten x, you know, fifteen x. Uh, okay. So whatever that works out to. But you know, my base case is seven to ten thousand uh, at the end of the cycle. Thank you, um, Eric. What are your thoughts on where gold and silver sure. goes? Well, you know, as I said at the outset, my going in proposition back in 2000, when gold was 260, was that the U.S. government is broke. I think there's an even stronger conviction in that now. I can understand all of these projections, whether it's Luke's, Pierre's uh, equivalent to the Dow, uh, Michael's uh, up 800 percent from the low. I can agree to all of those. Uh, and of course, I should say to the listeners we don't have to be correct uh, for for people to profit immensely from where we are. I mean, if it just went to $3,000, I mean, I'm sure the gold stocks would probably go up 100%. So that's probably more what I'd like to leave on the table, that you don't need to go to any of these levels to be a very successful investor in the precious metals area. Well noted. P.A., what are you thinking? I think that's, uh, you know, what Eric said is absolutely fair. And uh, I totally agree. Um, you know, I, I've invested in the gold space uh, for uh, literally 40 years. And uh, whether the gold price goes up or down, I still manage to make money because I invest in good asset with great people. And so that's the lesson. In terms of the gold price, I'm a little worried uh, for the next sort of like six months. I think that, uh, you know, I don't understand where uh, the, uh, the, you know, why I call it, refer to the whale, uh, where, where that market is going. I think there could be a downdraft at some point in time, like reality, because at the end of the day, it's that last physical ounce that sells, that sells, that sets the price. And, um, um, we're not seeing that right now, so I don't think that it's uh, um, uh, sustainable. That would be the right word. So, in the short term, um, you know, I think that the twenty four hundred dollars where we are, mm, maybe I'll go to twenty five hundred, but I don't think it's sustainable. I think we're going to have a bit of a, 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 you know, a back up in the gold price uh, for year end. Uh, I think after the election. Uh, funding the deficit is going to become a real issue and um, don't know if it's going to happen this year, but I would see uh, over the next 12 months, easily $3,200 uh, coming, uh, coming up. I, I would look at 12 months, longer term, like 26, 27, then particularly 27 and for all kinds of reason, political and whatever. Um, I think we could see, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like a one-to-one -one Dow gold ratio. I don't know where the Dow is going to be or, you know, or two-to-one gold ratio from uh, 15 today. Uh, so if it just goes down to even 10 to one, you're looking at, a, you know, 3,700. Uh, if you go at five to one, now you're looking at, you know, $7,500 gold. Is that possible? Entirely. So for silver, I think the ratio is way the um, when you have a gold bull market, it's always confirmed by the uh, silver ratio firming up against the dollar, and um, we could easily see uh, seventy to one, uh, which means like you know thirty five forty dollars silver over the next uh, eighteen months. That would be my view. Thank you. Uh, Ned, your last man home. Uh, what are you th thinking on the gold silver price? Well, as you know, I'm you know I'm going to wriggle like a worm to not give you an actual number um, for various <laughs> oversight reasons. But um, what I will do is just be a pedantic and 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 state that there is no gold price, uh, and it's important for people to recognise that that we we all fall into this, even the experienced people. 
talk about it like there's a gold price. It's, it's, it's a cross against all currencies. There is no gold price, but we're all obsessed with the US dollar gold price because the two things are competing with each other. Um, so when you ask me this, it's a question about what, what will happen to, to the two treasuries really over the next 12 months. How is the market going to vote on that? Um, I think the direction is set. There may well be pullbacks, like, like Pierre said. Um, I don't have particularly have a target because I see this as being the point at which people recognize what government issued credit money is. So I, I don't really think about it like that. But what I, what I do think about is how, how silver will behave versus gold. And um, I think that I think that we'll go below 70 this year. Um, so I, I would say the ratio of 70 to 1 is, is easily achievable. And I think we'll go below that, mainly due to the structure of the silver market and the fact that when we get through 330, it's obvious that the, that the structure starts to shake. So I, I think that the, the trick here is um, recognize that gold is just money. It's measuring your local currency and it's telling you what's happening to the dollar. When we talk about the gold price, that's all that's really talking about and treasuries. Um, and and I think that silver can be the thing that really moves the wheels. Thank you. Uh, well, gentlemen, panelists, uh, thank you for a fascinating uh, discussion. We've gone uh, well over the one hour, tomorrow like one and a half hours, and there's still over 300 people listening. We're going to uh, turn this into a YouTube video and send it out. Um, so each of you, Michael, Luke, Eric, Pierre, and Ned, I want to say thank you so much for your time. And if you would like to, in a year's time, we'll invite you back and we'll see what happened to the gold and silver price. Thank you so much. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure. Good day.